Seminary, so it was back in the historic times. For <laughs> uh, <coughs> my wife and I were attending a rather small Baptist church. Had been for a while, but suddenly a new a new family came, and they seemed to you know plug in nicely and get involved and. And the, the husband, in particular, befriended the pastor and some of the other men. Along about that time, the church thought it was necessary that they buy a bus. Bus ministry was a big thing back in those days. And so they were shopping around trying to find a bus that they could afford. And this particular individual, this fellow, he got really invested in that, involved in the process, uh, helping him find, and finally he, he located a, a bus, and they were all excited about it. The church decided to purchase the bus. Nobody really understood or knew that somehow in the process, he volunteered to take the funds, check, whatever it was, cashier's check, whatever, I don't know to take it and deliver it, and get the title for the bus, and bring the bus back. And so he took the check and left, and we never saw the bus or him again. Oh, now, last week, we talked about the different responses that there will be to the gospel during this day and age in which we live mystery form of the kingdom. And the focus of the parable last week was on the fact that there'll be various responses. And that will involve some, some people who seem to accept Christ, uh, at least on the outside, as far as you can tell, but they end up falling away. They never really had a change of heart. Remember, only number four in that list of the four hearts does Jesus say, they understood and bore fruit. The rest did not. So we concluded that during this age in which we live, there will be many false believers, <clears throat> false professions, but there will also be true conversions as well. And we must not be discouraged. Uh, it's, just, it's just what Jesus told us. Was going to be. Well, this week, the emphasis on the parable of the tares is just a little bit different. And this week, we're talking about people, not people that profess to believe and then walk away, but he's talking about people primarily, I believe, that profess to be and don't walk away. <laughs> so they kind of exist as false believers in this age. And we'll talk more about that uh, as we get along. So first of all, let's uh, refresh our memory here. Chapter 13, the mystery form of the kingdom because Jesus said, listen, this is a mystery. I tell you, a mystery. Uh, that simply means it was not revealed prior. So these parables are prophecies about a time period that would soon begin. And the time period stretches between his first and second coming. And we look at this chart briefly. This is from the Harvest House Publishers. But the Old Testament prophet looked across the mountaintops of the kingdom because almost, well, I say almost all, but 
vast majority of Old Testament prophecy was about the kingdom. And very little of anything said about the church age in here. So it's kind of like it was in the valley. They didn't, they didn't see that. And so what we have in Matthew 13 is pretty much the only prophecy we have about the age in which we live. Now there's a touch more as you get on into uh, Matthew 24 and 25 because that includes the tribulation period, which is part of this. Here's the chart we gave you, and I think we still have probably some of them over there from last week. You passed them out. Anybody wanted to have one to take home with them. But remember, the kingdom of heaven, as he says, these parables, each time he says, such and such is like the kingdom of heaven. So he's making a comparison. But the kingdom of heaven phrase that he uses is unique in a sense that the church age has it. It's, it's not here yet when he's speaking. They wouldn't know what he was talking about if he said the church age. They understand the kingdom that God has promised and the preliminary aspect of that kingdom exists during this time frame between his first coming, resurrection, and all the way through the tribulation period here down to his second coming. And we're going to see exactly why it stretches to the end of the tribulation before we're finished today. So, our second parable is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Let's look at Matthew chapter 13. And turn in your Bibles, if you will, to verse 24. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, now stop right there. Because remember last week, we said, there's nothing specifically in the parable of the sower that identifies it as a parable. But look what he says here. He presented another parable, which means the first parable, the parable of the sower, is also a parable like the others. And that's important to understand, not so much going forward from where we're at, but looking back now on the parable of the sower, there's that temptation to in interpret it in like three or four different ways or treat it as an allegory, uh, find significance in, in a number of things instead of a single thing. The parable of the sower, the second in this list of parables, is a parable. So what is a parable? We looked at it last week. We'll review quickly here. In the parable of the sower, we kind of bring that same figure, if you will, into the parable of the wheat and tares, because it's a farmer's field again that has been sown. But parables in particular have a singular meaning. So when interpreting a parable, look for the singular meaning, rather than find meaning in every aspect of the parable. This is a quick review of what we spent a lot more time on last week. But here's the, the key phrase we use. Remember, don't make a parable walk on all fours. Now, I don't know who came up with that phrase, but it's one that's easy to remember. Uh, and it simply means the parables have one basic meaning, not three, four, or whatever. So don't make a parable walk on all, all fours. Each of the parables, then, in Matthew 13, reveals one facet of the interim period between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's move forward. Now looking at the parable that tears in earnest, the parable here is drawn from something that is very familiar in the to the people living in the time of Christ. Just like the parable of the sower was. They had to sow fields that had thorns and that had underlying rock layers and, uh, and so forth. Well, this parable too is very understandable to the disciples and those hearing it as far as the analogy. I mean, he's comparing the farmer sowing the field with wheat, whatever, barley, and it's instead of just barley, has wheat and tares. 
That compares to something in the kingdom. The comparison is a singular concept, singular meaning. But the sowing part, the, the, the crop part and all that had various aspects and, and so forth. But it was something they understood, really, without explanation on that end, not necessarily the other end, because Jesus had to explain it uh, to his disciples. Well, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven would be like a man who sowed good seed in his field. However, the enemy came at night and sowed tares among the wheat. Now, let's just stop and read the rest of this. Uh, I stopped at verse 24. The rest of verse 24 says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man. May be compared, some translations it says, is like. It's a comparison. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now, the seed's going to have a little different meaning in this one. We'll get to that. But while his men were sleeping, the ones watching the field, tilling the field, because the owner of the field didn't do it all himself, while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for a while you are no for a while you are gathering up tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And then the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. I said this was a common occurrence that day, it is. It was. It was so common that the Romans had a law against someone coming into your field and sowing tares. So it was something they, they understood. It, it happened. But what is a tear? Okay. Uh, I think the right name is the Darnell plant. Uh, you, can, you can Google it and find out the information on it. But in summary, the tear was a plant that resembled wheat in its early stages of growth. Can't tell them why. <coughs> they look the same. So when the servants, the slaves here, discover the tares, it's fairly well along in the growing cycle. In fact, it's to the point where it's, they're starting to produce grain. Because that's the only way you can tell them apart. The station only becomes evident when the tares begin to bear grain. That's because the Darnell plant, which looks like the wheat plant, has grains that are very dark in color, dark purple or uh, black even, which is obviously distinguishable from wheat in the color of the grain of the wheat plant. So when the, when the service discovered the tares, they informed the owner of the field, who instantly knew what had happened. The owner said, oh, an enemy has come and sowed these. Well, because they obviously didn't sow. Now, why? The question is, why would an enemy do this? Well, why does an enemy do anything? Somebody that just didn't like the landowner. Maybe somebody that uh, was a rival as far as wheat production in that area. I mean, if you can cause the other man's field to take longer to harvest because he's got to separate the wheat and the tares, you can have your wheat to market first. That might be advantageous. It might even reduce the yield of the rival's field. It might have been purely out of spite. We, we don't know, but it happened. It happened very frequently. This is an agricultural society. It's how people made their living. And it was, it was competitive, to say the least. But the landowner instantly knew what had happened. And he, he says, yep, the enemy's done this. 
So then the landowner instructed the servants to leave the tares because they said, well, should we get out there and, and begin to, to pull up the tares? The only way they would, could have done that is to see the difference in the grain. You might have wondered at some time reading this, well, how would they know the difference if they looked the same? They have looked the same until a certain point. Now they're starting to bear grain. Now they don't look the same. That's how they knew there were tares in the field. And that's how they could have separated them at that point. But he told them to leave the tares into the harvest. Leave the tares into the harvest of the wheat and let the reapers, that should be the reapers of the plants. Let the reapers, I don't know, I'm just type something there again. <laughs> but anyway, leave the plants alone, both the wheat and the tares, until we're ready to harvest. Then you can separate them. Because if they're just beginning to bear grain, and you try to separate them now, the, the wheat would have some more grow, growth to, to need to do. And it might affect that. Might, they might damage some of those plants, or even kill some of the wheat plants. Let them grow until it's time to harvest. That don't matter. You take them, separate them, you have your wheat, you get rid of the, of the, the tares. By the way, some interesting information on the tares. If you try to eat tares, it'll make you sick. It's not just a benign plant. In fact, there's a French word for darnel, tares, which comes from the word to be drunk. Because people that actually mix the seed and would eat the tares could would begin to feel, you know, dizzy, disoriented. And if you eat enough of it, it'll kill you. So this, this wasn't just this wasn't just some benign plant that, that complicated the the owner's uh, task, but it could have done some damage if they it hadn't been discovered or some uh, un service that wasn't you know well versed in how to you know, mix it up. It, it could do a lot of damage. So the owner says, leave them alone until the harvest of the wheat, and let the reapers of the plants. Let the reapers separate. separate. Uh, let them reap the plants and burn the tares. I think what that should say. But let's move on before we get <laughs> So, when this parable is finished, which is at verse uh, 30, then we can have the, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. Now come back to verse 36. He says, then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Now remember, he was by the seashore, verses 1 to 3, teaching the multitudes these, <coughs> these parables. And he explains in, in here, we covered it last week, that he used parables to conceal truth from those who <coughs> didn't believe and that had already rejected him, but at the same time reveal truth to the believers. But the disciples were a little confused. If, this is, if we're supposed to understand this, we better make sure we get this right. And in fact, there's some evidence, uh, if you compare the cross-reference in Luke, uh, I think he explained all these parables to the disciples. Or he may have, at least. But we only get two explained. The parable of the sower, which we saw last week and the parable of the tares. There's only two explanations recorded in the scripture, so let's look at it. Now he's in the house. The crowds are going. The disciples ask the question, verse 37, and he said, to one who sows the good seed, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's the Lord Jesus' favorite name for himself. And it emphasizes uh, his humanity, son of man, but... Uh, that was for a reason, too. He didn't openly proclaim a lot of things in those dangerous days. And uh, he says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. And the field is the world. By the way, some people think the sower of the good seed in the parable of the sower was also the Lord, but it doesn't say that. The seed is the word of God in the sower. The seed is something different than the, this parable here. Uh, and the field is the world. 
And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. So in this parable, the seed doesn't represent the message that is responded to. No, that's the previous parable. Don't connect. In this parable, the seeds that are planted in the world represent believers who have accepted Christ and, and, and you know, are living in this present kingdom. And the tares are the bad seed sown by the evil one or Satan, which means they are unbelievers. Verse 39, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just, so just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks, and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So, reviewing. Jesus interprets the parable now. He identifies the landowner as himself, the son of man, the one who sowed the field. The field is the world, the seeds as the sons of the kingdom. The tares, the sons of the wicked one, the enemy, the devil, the harvest, and this is crucial here, the harvest, as the end of the age, the reapers, the angels. It gets confusing if you pull these two parables together and you've you got to keep them separate. They have different meanings. Now you know why the kingdom of heaven stretches from the first coming all the way to the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation period, at the end of the age. You say, well, how do we know he means the age that goes all the way to the end of the tribulation? Because the angels come, they find both believers and unbelievers, they separate out the tares, the unbelievers who are judged, and the wheat goes into the kingdom. That's what he just said right here. We just read it. The righteous then will shine forth as a sun in the kingdom. Now, when he says will shine forth as uh, the sun in the kingdom, he's talking about the millennial kingdom, which is the final promised kingdom going all the way back to Abraham, the Davidic covenant, Discussed that a couple weeks ago. So we know the, the time frame here. It not only is the church age here, but it includes the tribulation as well, because it stretches to the judgment. Now we'll come back to this in a later parable as well. So now that we know all this, we've come this far. Let's try to conceptualize or put on paper the singular meaning or interpretation of the parable. Now, you can phrase it different ways. This doesn't come out of the Bible, this is just the way I put it down in words. The presence of hypocrites is normal during the interim period, but will not be overlooked by God. Probably, technically, you can, you can eliminate this part and will not be overlooked by God. That's an additional fact that he gave them. But the singular present, the singular meaning of the parable basically is the presence of hypocrites is going to be normal during the age in which we live. Now, I chose the word hypocrites for a reason. The word hypocrite means actor in the Greek. And it, it refers to someone who's pretending to be something they're not. So, one thing that we come up against continually when we're trying to reach people for Christ is this problem. Well, you know, I knew so and so, and they claimed to be a Christian, and they did such and such. Or I know somebody, this is where I know somebody goes to your church, and you know, and then I know they're doing, yeah, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Believe me, I've heard that one a lot. 
you just got a lot of hypocrites in your church. You know what my response is to that became over the years? You're right. We do. Now, why is that? Because all of us are hypocritical at some point, somewhere, somehow. You know what I mean? But we're not perfect. And that's something I would say. Yeah, I'm sure there's people in our church that have acted hypocritically, but we're not perfect. That's why Christ died for us. You know, you, you turn that around. But it's also true that it's quite likely, certainly possible, that in any church, there's going to be people there that are not true believers. They, they go along, they say the right things, they act the right way, they do the right things, they get involved here. But maybe for the totally for the wrong reasons. Why would somebody want to be a false professor who doesn't walk away but stays involved? There's got to be ulterior motives. Financial motives. Some people just like notoriety, especially if they get in the leadership position or power. I can honestly say to you, one of the most common issues I ever faced as a pastor was this struggle for power. I wouldn't even want to try to tell you or bore you with all the details of the people over the years who tried to be my best friend so they could tell me what to do and how to run the church. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, most of them were somebody else's best friend when they found out I wasn't going to let them tell me how to run the church. <laughs> But I use the word hypocrite here in reference to not the ones who profess and fall away, but to the ones who profess and, and stick around. But history is full of examples. You look at the history of Christianity down through the years, from, from the days of Constantine forward, when the, when the church was incorporated with the state through Roman Catholicism. Roman Empire and right on down to, you know, the church in England and the king took over and separated from the Catholic Church and took over and became the head of the Church of England. And I suppose he still is, technically. Doesn't mean that God didn't reach in by his grace and pull a lot of great people out of that church. People like Wesley. Whitfield, others. But corruption at the upper levels. And we can take the time, we won't, we can take the time to talk about different denominations, even here in America. And uh, I grew up in a different denomination I departed from. I and mean, that's, you just, you know, you, they depart from the truth, they depart from the Bible. But they're still religious figures. So the presence of hypocrites is normal, okay? So I hate to start with a sad story. But what we're talking about here is a sad story. <laughs> so we gotta talk about the, the, this is the this is the the underside of Christendom in this age. And Satan is behind it. Because he's the one who sows the bad seed. If he can confuse the issue in this world as to who God is and what God's done for us and how we can be recipients of eternal life, he blinds the mind of unbelievers, right? That's what he's all about. Talk about some applications. Okay, we realize we're respected. What's it mean to us? Well, first of all, there's only two kinds of people in the interim period. They're believers, true believers, 
and non-believers, which includes obvious non-believers and false professors. But really there's only two, saved and unsaved. <laughs> there's a lot of people in present day evangelicalism who would like to compromise that viewpoint. John 14, 6. Let's turn here and read it. I know we all probably have that memorized. I don't think I can anybody to read. But it's it's not just a nice verse, a comforting verse that well, I think is very often used in funerals as a verse of assurance. But it's also a very stark verse that represents a, a sober reality. And Jesus said unto them, I am the way. No, I'm not one of the ways. I am the way. And the truth. I'm not just somebody who has some of the truth. I have the truth. I am the truth. I am the way. I am the truth. And the life. Nobody else has life but me. <coughs> the Islamic folks believe Mohammed descended back to or ascended back to heaven. That's why they built the, the shrine, the dome of the rock, you know, the temple. The problem is we also know where Muhammad's buried. <laughs> he never ascended anywhere. But Jesus is the only the only religious leader, if I could use that term in, in a loose sense here, that ever rose to the dead. And there is absolutely irrefutable evidence that he did. Do you, I suggest you read that book, in case for Easter. Mm -hmm. Please troubles one of at least three men I know and have read about in the last uh, three or four hundred years that were atheists that became Christians and wrote about it. One other man was named Henry Morrison. He was an Englishman. He wrote a book, Who Moved the Stone? And when they actually studied the evidence of the gospel, were totally convinced. People with legal minds. Irrefutably proven. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But he didn't quit there. No one. He didn't say, well, you know, everybody believes, and maybe I'll let a few others in. No, he says, no one comes to the Father but through me. Period. There are only two kinds of people. We need to remember that. This gives us an urgency to share the gospel with this world. Secondly, we should expect true and false believers to be present during this period of time and not become preoccupied with determining just who is <laughs> real and who's not. Who has Matthew 7, 13 to 15? I give that to somebody. Uh, I did not give that to anybody. That's the reason why you don't have it. <laughs> I, I'll read it. I'm, just, I'm, I'm looking at my notes. I'm just supposed to, I'm just supposed to go back and refresh your memory because we had it last week. That's the parable of the two roads, the narrow road and the wide road. Why is the road wide? We've discussed it all. Because there's a lot of people traveling that road. Why is the road to heaven narrow? There's not so many. Now let's go to number three. It is not our responsibility. If we should never become preoccupied with determining who is who, it is not our responsibility to condemn anyone. Now we can read Matthew 7, 1 to 5. That's what I should have been asking. <laughs> Do not judge unless you be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not notice the long that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye? The hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you, you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. When you 
read verse 1, do not judge. It uses a particular Greek word meaning to judge, which has the basic idea of don't render a verdict. This is the Greek word which referenced someone going to trial, they're convicted, and the judge condemns them. It's not our responsibility to condemn anyone. Listen, well, what about the rest of this? If we, if we do that, if we, if we conclude that in our mind, are we in danger of losing something? Yes, but not our salvation. Here's where the broader scope of theology has to be brought to bear on what Jesus is saying here. When he says in verse 2, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged, he's not talking about being judged in the same way. <laughs> he's not talking about having a verdict pronounced of, on us that, you know, we're lost. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ, where our service, our motives will be evaluated to determine whether or not we will have this reward or that reward in eternity. Now, here's the thing. We can do all the right things. We can have the right motives. But if we are overly condemning, it can detract from our rewards. That's all he's saying here. But again, you, you don't pick that up as you read this here. You've got, to have, you've got to have the rest of the New Testament and then filter it through that. But remember that, that word. Render a verdict. Now, who has 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 2.15? I do. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. We appraise all things, but we're not appraised by anybody. Now, in some, some translations it says, the spiritual man judges all things, but is judged by no man. So we're told not to judge in Matthew 7, and then 1 Corinthians 2.15 says, the spiritual person judges or appraises all things. Different word in the original. It's not the word for render a verdict. The word for rendering a verdict is a basic Hebrew or basic Greek word, krino. The word in 1 Corinthians 2.15 attaches preposition that becomes anakrino, which means not render a verdict, but make an evaluation. So that, that translation you read gets it right. We just have to understand, yeah. And, and if you look at 1 Corinthians 2.15, it says it prizes, appraises what? The spiritual appraises all things. All things. All things. It doesn't say all men. So... If somebody who seems to be a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ is acting one way and you know it's wrong and maybe you've even admonished them and they've been rebuked and they continue to do that, you, you can definitely appraise that action. We know right's right and wrong's wrong. And we have a responsibility to try to help people, correct people, admonish people. The spiritual person can judge all things in that sense. And the autocrino, appraise all things or assess all things, that doesn't mean to render a final verdict. It just means to make an evaluation. Come to a conclusion about actions, not render a verdict on a person. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 4 or 5. <laughs> Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. New American says, Do not go on passing 
judgment before the time. Others use the word, don't judge anything before the time. Guess which word it is? It goes back to Matthew 7, primo. Don't render a verdict. Don't render a verdict. Don't pass judgment. Now, if you back up in the context, Paul says in verse 2, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards, and he's speaking of himself, who re people who reveal the mysteries of God, verse 1, teachers, preachers, those who understand the word, communicate the word, speaking of that in that regard. In, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy or faithful, it says in some, some, some translations. Then Paul says this, but to me it's a very small thing that I should be examined by you. He uses Crino. It's a small thing if you're going to render a judgment on my ministry. It's a small thing if you're going to render a judgment on me personally. It matters not to me. You're only hurting yourself if you do that. It's a small thing that I may be examined, condemned by you, or by any human court, in fact. I do not even examine myself, he says. I don't render a verdict on my life. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't know he's saved. He's talking about his ministry, his, his obedience to Jesus Christ, and whether or not and how much God chooses to reward him. He does, yeah, I, I don't know where that stand. That's God's business. None of us know where we're going to stand come the judgment seat of Christ. He says, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord, and still, still Crino, the one who gives the verdict, is the Lord. Then verse 5, therefore do not go on rendering verdicts. Some things are left in the hands of God, and should be. And number four, we need to recognize the value that we have in this world and boldly proclaim the truth. Now somebody should have Matthew 5. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Salt was a very valuable commodity in the day Paul wrote. In fact, Roman soldiers were actually sometimes paid with salt. So it wasn't overly abundant. What makes something valuable is not a lot of it. We have plenty today. You can go back to the days of the Civil War in the South. Salt was very hard to come by. Salt was very valuable. <clears throat> Today, it's relatively cheap. We've got plenty of it. When, when, when <clears throat> Jesus was speaking, it was a valuable commodity. Unless it lost its saltiness. Now, the way it makes salt unsalty, the only way you can make salt unsalty is to combine it with something. Chemically, I guess. If it becomes contaminated, some other substance. It seems like gypsum comes to my mind. Um, I didn't go back and check all my facts on this. I believe that that's what commonly happened. And if salt loses its salt, it has no, it has no value as a, uh, something to use with food or preserve meat or anything like that. It loses all that. <clears throat> Light is essential to everything. The sun don't shine, we all die. Everything dies. And if we're the light of the world like the sun, you certainly don't want to cover it up. If we're the light of the world like this, in a sense, in the comparison like the sun, you don't want to put a bushel over your, you know, spread a tarp over your, you know, hide your closet or, you know, flee to the mountains and never come back because the world's so terrible. Because we are the salt of the earth and we're the light of the world. Two essentially valuable commodities. 
Salt can be contaminated. We can be contaminated spiritually. Light can be concealed. We can conceal the light we have. But we're to let our light shine. You know, we're to let others see our good works so they glorify our Father. Right? We may be in the minority. There may be a lot of fakes out there. There may be a lot of problems caused by people that pretend to be believers. But in spite of all of that, we are very, very valuable to the plan of God, the purpose of God, and to those who need to come to God. And we can't back off. We can't give up. We can't just discourage and say, what can I do? What difference can I make? I referred to Ad Nairam just, I think, last week, the first, or one of the first group of American missionaries that left New England around 1812 and went to Burma, served for 30 plus years there. He lost seven children, mostly in infancy. <clears throat> Finally lost his wife there, remarried after six years, and his second wife died. He spent many years in prison, persecuted, on the verge of death. It took him six years to get one convert. And by the time he died, they said that he just had a few. But during that 30 years, he translated the Bible into the Burmese language. Maramara is just today, not Burma. But he translated the Bible into the Burmese language. Old Testament and New Testament. And after his death, Christianity exploded in Burma. Thousands came to know Christ. Many, many churches. Never, never think that I can't do much. I'm not. What, what difference will I make? You never know. We never know. Because it's not, we ultimately know they're difference makers. It's God using us. It's God through us. This is the reality of the day in which we live, but don't let it be a reason to hide, to give up, get discouraged, quit. That's why Jesus told them this. That's why it's in the scripture, so we understand this. It's critical to our spiritual life. Anybody want to add a word or testimony, a comment, something you've seen in the scripture we have commented on? Question. Question on, on judging, Jay. Uh, we can condemn people's actions when, when they don't line up with Scripture. Would you say that's correct? No. He uses the word evaluate or bring into judicial evaluation. We, we evaluate actions. That's the word used in 1 Corinthians 2.15. It's not the word for condemn. So, when we evaluate another person's actions, maybe confront them, whatever, uh, that's pro appropriate. Because they may be true believers, they've just made sinful choices. And we, we should not give up on them either. See, our, our, our tendency is someone greatly disappoints us and they're not acting like a Christian, maybe even somebody uh, falls under church discipline, Matthew 18. At the end of that process, which Matthew describes there, he says, and if they will not hear the church, let them be unto you as a public man of a sinner, or even whatever, and a public. As is the key. He's saying, let them be to you as, not, it doesn't say for us to condemn them, they might be reached. The man who sinned so badly in 1 Corinthians, that Paul writes about, for incest and, and other things, comes back. 2 Corinthians, he's telling them, accept the man. 
Forgive the man. So we're never to write people off. And that's our tendency. Yeah. Is the, it seems to me that the, the word is not to be condemned in that case. It just recognize the, uh, recognize the sin, I guess, in that case. It's just be recognized and be aware of it and maybe provide counsel if it's appropriate. Sure. But, they hate the sin, love the sinner. Yes. I and mean, when we do that, we're not condemning them. We're correcting them. But if I say, oh, so and so is just not a believer, and oh, 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 I don't want anything more, more to do with him, uh, that's, we don't want to give up. Because we don't know. Are they simply a believer who is out of fellowship with God, or are they not? We don't know. We can't make that judgment. We can't make that call. Now, the church sometimes is pressed to have to make a decision, Matthew 18. But even then, they don't give up. You don't give up on first. At the moment you, someone's been disciplined, you treat them or think of them or act toward them uh, as a, if they were an unbeliever, you admonish them, you try to correct them, but you don't fellowship with them, you know, intimately, you don't give up on them. Right? Anybody else? I know this is just a weird question, but the tares and the wheat, you let them uh, grow together. Does the tear uh, seeds not fall off at the same time the wheat happens? Because we're talking out there where people are out there whacking away at the, the stuff. The stuff is all growing together so you're going to have a handful of tares and wheat at the same time. So now you're going to go one to one. You just have to do it by hand, one by one, separate. Okay. That's why it was a bad thing. But it's so easy if both are, are dropping seeds at the same time. Um, you know, yeah, I threw the tear away, but oh, guess what? I dropped a whole bunch in my stuff. So you have to be really careful, yeah. Mm -hmm. They couldn't thresh it, they couldn't thresh it together. Right. They had to separate the plates. Okay. Uh, what about the chaff? The chaff? They, didn't they throw it? I mean, was that, would that blow the tears away? Necessarily? No, the, the, the tears were a different plant, so they were not threshed. Oh. Not separated with the chaff or anything. You just, you separate the plants, you bundled up the tears, you took them over here and you burned them. After you separate the wheat, you took them to the threshing floor. I think that's I'm no expert. Since we have a minute, I was just going to share a little story this week on the power of God's word. We were out in Lone Star, kind of out by this like we normally do. And a guy came up and says, I'm glad to see you guys here. I got a, a pocket Bible from someone four years ago in prison, and I got to say what he did, and I just wanted to let you know I'm back here going to school. And I'm starting to make some calls. So this is how our God's Word changes his life. We don't often see the end of the story because we give a Bible and they're off and gone. I just wanted to share that. It's Thank you, Lord. The power of God's Word. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning and give you the praise, Lord, for just revealing to us our future, revealing to us, Lord, the day we're, we're living in, you know, and all that we face, helping us come to grips with it. Lord, everything's proceeding on plan. There's great and glorious days ahead, Lord, so we look forward to you coming back. We look forward to the kingdom in earnest. Father, we just thank you for the privilege of being called your child. We are amazed at the grace you bestowed upon us. We praise you for it the best we can in our weakened human state. We give you the glory in Jesus' name.